Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston and welcome to lecture 39 of Advanced Linear Algebra. Today we're going to talk about what we can do with the pseudo inverse of a matrix. So remember in the previous lecture we talked about what the pseudo inverse is, right? It's this matrix that you can construct out of the singular value decomposition of a matrix and it sort of generalizes the inverse of a matrix, right? If a matrix has an inverse, if it's invertible, then the pseudo inverse and the inverse are the same thing. But the pseudo inverse has the advantage of existing for arbitrary matrices. And what happens if you try to solve a linear system via the pseudo inverse of a matrix? Well, it turns out that it works really well. It does really good things, regardless of which of the three possible cases of a linear system you fall into, regardless of whether it has a unique solution or it has infinitely many solutions or it has no solutions. Okay, so we're going to go through those three cases throughout this lecture. Okay, so this first theorem handles two of those cases. It handles the case where you have a unique solution or you have infinitely many solutions. So let's see what it says. Well, it says if you've got any matrix over, you know, the real or complex numbers, then the linear, and suppose that your linear system AX equals B, suppose it has at least one solution. So we're in the either one solution or infinitely many solutions case. Okay, well, then when you construct this vector, this supposed solution vector X equals A pseudo inverse times B, Okay, just like if your matrix was invertible, right, you would do x equals a inverse times b. Okay, so we're just replacing the a inverse by the pseudo inverse here. So when you construct that vector, well, that's always going to be a solution. Even if your matrix has infinitely many solutions or like, I mean, even if you're not invertible, right? Okay, that'll still be a solution no matter what. And furthermore, something really, really nice happens. It's not only a solution, but actually it's the smallest solution. If you pick any other solution y, that vector is going to have strictly bigger norm than this solution that we constructed here. And we'll talk about sort of geometrically why that's a desirable property in a minute. Okay, so first off, let's prove this theorem. Let's see where it comes from. Okay, why do pseudo inverses solve linear systems? I mean, certainly this is true. I mean, certainly this part's true here uh, if A is invertible. We already know that from the previous class, but why is it true in general? Okay, and the way that we're going to prove this is we're going to start off by writing things down in their orthogonal rank one sum decomposition. Okay, so write down just some orthogonal rank one sum decomposition of your matrix A, and then do the same thing for A dagger, the pseudo inverse, just by definition is this guy here. Okay, so what happens now? Well, we want to show that this is a solution. That's our first step. Okay, so I want to show that if I do A times this, I get B. All right, so how am I going to do that? Well, I've got to do a tiny bit of setup before I can actually do some matrix calculations here. And that setup is going to be, I'm going to notice that first, since I'm assuming that AX equals B has a solution, I know that B is in the range of A, right? Because A times something equals B. So B is in the range of A. It's in the set of all possible outputs of A. Okay, but also I know from a theorem from last week, theorem 9.2, that the set of U vectors, that forms an orthonormal basis of the range of A. Okay, right? Remember that theorem, it told us that, hey, some of the U vectors, they form an orthonormal basis of the range of A. Some of the U vectors, they form an orthonormal basis of the null space of A star, and so on for each of the four fundamental subspaces of a matrix. Okay, well, if I combine these two facts that I've got right here, I find that I can write B as some linear combination of those U vectors, right? I can write B, because these U vectors are a basis of a space that B lives in, I can write B as some linear combination of those vectors, okay? So I'm going to use that fact in this upcoming calculation. Okay, so now my goal is to show that this vector A dagger B, I want to show that actually is a solution of this linear system. So I want to show that A times it equals the vector b. Okay, so how do I do that? Well, I'm just going to plug in all of the different formulas that I've seen for these three objects, right? I wrote down a, an orthogonal rank one sum decomposition for a up above. Here it is. I wrote down the definition of a dagger, the pseudo inverse up above. Here it is. Okay, and also I just wrote down a nice sum for b up above. Okay, so I'm writing down this sum. Now I'm just writing in summation notation for it so, so that it's a little bit more compact. Okay, and now I'm just going to compute this product. Okay, and I mean, it's going it, to, you, you think it's going to be ugly because you're doing a sum times a sum times a sum. You think you're going to get an ugly triple sum at the end of the day, but orthogonality saves us. Okay, lots of these products are going to be zero and go away and the sum's going to collapse down. All right, so the first instance of this is, well, if I do this product on the right first, okay, I'm leaving the left term alone. I just copy and pasted it down. I'm computing this right product first. Okay, and when I do that, what happens is I get a Vj times a Uj star times a Uj. 
Okay, and this is really nice because a uj star times some other uj, okay, first off, these are coming from different sums, so these subscripts don't actually have to match up. It's actually like a ui star times uj. And what happens there is, well, ui star times uj, that's the dot product of ui and uj, right? And these are vectors coming from an orthonormal basis. So this inner product, this dot product, it equals one if the subscripts match, and it equals zero otherwise. So this double sum product on the right here it collapses down into a single sum because lots of these products are zero. So all you're left with is just, well, the product of the scalars, C, Cj over sigma j, times, well, uj star uj, that's just one, okay? So all I'm left with is just the vj on the right there. Okay, so the double sum collapses down into a single sum, and that's really nice. And now we just do the same thing again. To compute this product here, just use the same idea, okay? We get, we're get we gonna get a double sum, except there's a vj star here times a vj. And what happens when you do that? Well, if the subscripts match, you just get the number one. And if the subscripts don't match, the, the term goes away. So you don't actually get a double sum when you multiply these two sums together. You just get a single sum and the vj star vj just goes away, it just dies off. So all you're left with is sigma j times cj over sigma j. So the sigma j's cancel, you're just left with, sigma, with cj, and then you're left over with this uj as well, okay? So you've got the sum of cj times uj, and I mean, that just is b, right? That's the sum formula for b that we plugged in at the start, okay? So yeah, ax does equal b, so in particular, this vector, it really is a solution of this linear system, even if the inverse doesn't exist. All right, well, there's another part of this theorem that we haven't proved here, right? There's also this furthermore remark, okay? So I'm gonna go back up and remind you of that. This furthermore remark, it said, like, not only is this a solution, but it's the smallest solution. Every other solution is bigger in norm than this particular solution here, okay? And we're not gonna prove that in this video, okay? We're not gonna prove that in class. It's in the textbook, it's kind of technical, and it makes use of makes use of facts about orthogonal projections, which we have not covered in this lecture series, okay? So that's why I'm skipping over it. Okay, so that's really nice, okay? So let's see how this works. Let's, let's go through an actual example of how we can use this to our advantage, okay? And let's talk about why it's desirable, not only to find a solution via this method, but why it's desirable, like the fact that it finds the smallest solution. All right, so let's, let, let's go back to this linear system that we saw in the previous lecture, okay? Remember this linear system, it has a solution. In fact, it has infinitely many solutions. We showed that the set of all solutions, it is this, right? It's just a set of uh, vectors of the form x3, and then three minus two x3, and then x3, where x3 can be anything. It was a free variable in that linear system, okay? So the solution set, it's a line, in other words, right? We've got one degree of freedom here. All right, so this line, the solution set here, it has, some vectors that are hideous and some vectors that are not so hideous. For I mean, you can choose x3 to be anything you like. So I could choose it to be some big ugly number, like 371, for example, and that would give me this solution here, right? This is some vector that's on this line, so it is a valid solution of this linear system up here. Okay, but I mean, kind of why would you do that? There are nicer solutions out there. For example, if I just choose x3 to be one, then I'll find the solution just one, 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 if I just plug in x3 equals one everywhere in there. Right? And the solution 111, in some sense, it's nicer, it's smaller, it's simpler, okay? So that's sort of the idea here. Um, like the fact that the pseudo inverse finds the smallest solution, in some, ha in some sense, it's nice. It just, I mean, there's, there's no point in going really far out on the line to find a solution. Just find the one that's closest to the origin, right? Okay, so it sort of finds you the, the least large and ugly solution out there, okay? So here, here I've just drawn, or my computer has drawn, um, the solution set of this linear system. It's this line here, okay? It's the line going through 0, 3, 0 uh, in the direction of the vector 1, minus 2, 1. Okay, so that's what the solution set of that linear system is. And I mean, like there are lots of very large solutions on this line, right? I mean, if you go far enough out that way or far enough out that way, you find very large and ugly vectors. But near the origin, there are some nice ones. In particular, this vector 111, that's the solution of smallest norm. That's the solution that you're gonna find if you use this pseudo inverse technique, if you compute A dagger times B. All right, so that's sort of why we like small solutions, okay. So that was all what happens if you have a solution, if your linear system has a unique solution or if it has infinitely many solutions. But what happens if your linear system doesn't have a solution, right? Well, if there are no solutions, then of course you can't find one, right? A dagger times B, it's not gonna be a solution, 
but in some sense, it's the best non-solution. It's the closest thing to a solution, even though a solution doesn't exist. It's the next best thing. Okay, and what we mean by that is, well, it's the vector that minimizes the distance between AX and B, right? Our goal is to get AX equal to B, okay? Well, the next best thing, if we can't make AX equal to B, our next best thing would be to make the distance between AX and B as small as possible. So in other words, we wanna minimize the norm of the difference between AX and B. Okay, and it turns out that's exactly what the pseudo inverse method does. Okay, if we choose x to be a dagger b again, well, this is what happens. Okay, so we've got a theorem here. It says, okay, so great. Suppose that you've got just some matrix, real or complex entries, and you've got a right hand side. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to construct x equals a dagger b again. Okay, and then it turns out that the norm of AX minus B is always less than or equal to the norm of AY minus B, no matter what Y you pick. In other words, AX is closer to B than any AY is as close to B, right? The distance between AX and B is smaller or, or equal to the distance between AY and B, no matter what Y you pick, no matter what other vector you pick. So X, this vector here, really is, it's the closest thing to a solution, even if you don't have a solution. Okay, so again, we've skipped over some details about orthogonal projections earlier in the course, so we're not going to prove this theorem. It's in the textbook, and you can go through the details there if you want, but there are too, too many technicalities without having orthogonal projections at our disposal to do it here. Okay, so instead, let's jump into an example. Let's see why this is useful and how to actually do it, okay, how to use this theorem in practice. So this is really useful in particular when you're modeling, okay, if you've got some data and you want to sort of explain the patterns that are going on behind the data, okay, so to sort of illustrate how to use this theorem and what it tells us is suppose that, you know, we had four data points, okay? Suppose that we had x equals zero, y equals 0 0.5, you know, we, we measured these four data points. I don't know what x, x and y are representing, but, you know, for every, for every x, there's some corresponding y, and these are the values that we, we measured. Okay, x was zero and y was 0 0.5, x was one, well, that made y equal one, and when x was two, y equals was two, and when x was three, y was 3.5. Okay, there seems to be some relationship between X and Y here. We don't know exactly what it is, but if I plot those four points, here they are, okay? So I've just plotted them on my X and Y axes. Okay, now suppose what I wanted to do is I wanted to find the line that best describes that data that I've got so far, okay? Certainly I can't find a line that exactly describes this data. There, there is no straight line that goes through all four of these points. Okay, but what if I just want to find the line that goes through these points sort of as best as possible? Okay, in particular, what if I want to find the line that minimizes the, the sum of squares of vertical distances between the lines and the data points here? Okay, well, that's exactly what our method is going to do. Okay, so let's go through why this happens. Okay, so what I'm looking for here is I'm looking for a line of best fit. I'm looking for a line that goes through the data points as best as possible, even though it can't exactly go through them. All right, well, the setup here, the way that you do this is set up the linear system that you wish you could solve. I wish I could find a line that goes through all four data points. Okay, so I wish I could find a line y equals mx plus b that hits all four data points. In other words, for which if I plug in the X value, I get the Y value. So if I plug in X equals zero, I get Y equals 0 0.5. And if I plug in X equals one, I get Y equals one. And if I plug in X equals two, I get Y equals two. And if I plug in X equals three, I get Y equals 3.5. That's the linear system that I wish I could solve. If I could solve this, then there would be a line going through all four of those points. Okay. But of course, this is a linear system with four equations, but only two variables, right? My two variables are m and b. I want to solve for the slope and the y-intercept. And typically, I mean, you can't solve linear systems like that. There's just too many restrictions, too many equations. I have more equations than variables. But thanks to this method, even though there's no solution, I can still find the next best thing. I can find the closest non-solution, and that's what we're going to do. Okay, so this linear system, yeah, it has four equations, but only two variables, probably no solutions. And I mean, you can go through and try to solve it and you will see that there is no solution. So let's do the pseudo inverse method. Okay, so let's write down in matrix form, write down this linear system in matrix form, AX equals B. So there's the linear system up there, write down in matrix form. Here it is. Here's your coefficient matrix A. 
your variable vector x just has m and b in it, the two variables you're trying to solve for. And then your right-hand side just contains the y values in it, right? These are the 0 0.5, 1, 2, and 3.5 y values on the, the right hand side, or I guess the way that I wrote it up above, the left hand side of the linear system. Okay, so now all we have to do is we compute a dagger times this vector b, okay? So we have to compute the pseudo inverse of a, okay? And you could try to do this by hand, you're gonna find that it actually gets really, really ugly really quickly, okay? This matrix has a horrific singular value decomposition, and I mean, typically, if you just pick a random matrix, it's gonna have a nasty singular value decomposition. If you're trying to go through it by hand using, you know, exact arithmetic, it's gonna be ugly. For example, the largest singular value of this matrix, it's the square root of nine plus the square root of 61, and smaller singular value is the same thing except with a minus sign in between, okay? And then you've also gotta find the unitary matrices u and v in the singular value decomposition. v isn't too bad, but the unitary matrix u, it's four by four and it's hideous. Don't bother. We're gonna skip over that. We're just gonna use computer software to help us out, okay? It turns out even though the singular value decomposition is kind of nasty for this matrix, the pseudo inverse isn't too bad. It's just one over 10 times this matrix. Every, every entry is just some rational number it's, and they've got a common denominator of 10. Okay, and this happens fairly frequently. Even if the singular value decomposition itself is nasty, things often simplify down in the pseudo inverse. Okay, and I mean, maybe it feels a little bit like a cheat using computer software to find the pseudo inverse, but I mean, this is sort of how it's done in practice. I mean, like maybe we give you a couple toy examples to go through by hand in class, but I mean, in practice, people aren't computing pseudo inverses or singular value decompositions by hand, right? I mean, we do it numerically. So that's what we're gonna do here. It's more realistic anyway. Okay, so we've got our a dagger, we've got our vector b, now you just multiply, okay? The least square solution, the, the closest thing to a solution, even though there is no solution, it's just x equals a dagger times b. So do that matrix multiplication. I just plopped in my a dagger here, and then here's my vector b, and you just multiply them out, and you get the vector one and a quarter, okay? So that's our solution vector. And remember what x is, Remember x, if we go back up, what is x? Well, it's, it's the vector with m and b as its entries, the slope and the y-intercept. So the slope m is one, and the y-intercept b is one quarter, okay? So that's all that tells us, okay? The closest, the, sort of the line of best fit is the one with slope one and y-intercept a quarter. All right, so the line of best fit is x equals, or sorry, y equals x plus a quarter. And if we go back up to the little picture that we drew at the start, I mean, that seems kind of reasonable, right? It looks like the line of best fit, yeah, maybe it should have a slope somewhere around one, and its y-intercept should be small anyway. Yeah, quarter looks reasonable, okay? Okay, and this exact same method works even if you're not trying to find a line of best fit for 2D data, but if you had like three-dimensional data, okay? So data where it's like x, y, z triples instead of just x and y pairs, okay? Then you've got data living in three-dimensional space. You really wish, hey, maybe I could describe it via a plane or something like that. I could find a plane that goes through all of it. In general, you're not going to be able to do those. So what you do is you set up the linear system where that describes what would happen if you did have a plane going through it, Okay, and then you just solve it via the pseudo inverse method and that'll give you the plane of best fit. Okay, and it even works if you're not trying to find something flat, okay? If you're trying to find some other linear combinations of functions, right? You can think of this method that we just went through as trying to find, you know, the linear combination of the constant one and, you know, the, the monomial x to find the linear combination of those two functions that best describes my data. But you could also do something like find a linear combination of sine and cos that best describes my data or find me an exponential function, right? A linear combination of say e to the x and a constant function that best describes my data. And you can do those all using the exact same method. You just pin down which functions you want to consider and then set up the linear system that would correspond to, yes, this linear combination goes through all of my data points and you solve it via the pseudo inverse method, via this method that we just did up here. Okay, so it actually is very general. It's much more general than we've shown here. Okay, so to summarize, the pseudo inverse based method of solving a linear system, it works best no matter which type of linear system you've got. So if you've got a linear system AX equals B that has a unique solution, then that unique solution is A dagger times B. It's the pseudo inverse times B. Okay, maybe you don't have a unique solution though. If your linear system has infinitely many solutions, well, a dagger times b, it's still a solution. And not only is it a solution, it's the smallest of all the solutions. It has the smallest norm of all the solutions. And finally, if your linear system has no solutions, well, then this a dagger times b, it's the closest thing to a solution. It's sort of the best non-solution out of all of the many non-solutions out there. 
Okay, so that'll do it for our discussion of the pseudo inverse. Next class, we're gonna see another thing that we can do with a singular value decomposition, which is find a better way of measuring the size of a matrix, okay? So we're gonna introduce something called the operator norm of a matrix. I'll see you then.